tester.co.uk Hello YouTubers and welcome to this part 2 of the tutorial on how to use an oscilloscope. Now if you haven't yet watched the first part of this tutorial I'm going to annotate it here so that you can go and look because in that tutorial I kind of familiarize yourself with some of the knobs and adjustments that you make on an oscilloscope to try and acquire a signal. So basically I teach you what, how an oscilloscope works and how to make the adjustments to get your signal into the screen. Now going forwards we're going to start moving on to the kind of more advanced techniques and the more advanced uses of an oscilloscope. So we're going to in this video and the next video we're going to talk about acquiring a signal. So in particular um, it can be quite tricky to actually capture a signal inside that screen and then we also sometimes want to capture something that there's a glitch or a fault. So we have to know how to trigger the oscilloscope to capture that and to analyze it. Now, what I want to do to, as an analogy for the rest of the series, because I think the analogy will help, help you give you a good basic understanding of how the oscilloscope works and give you something as a comparison to what the controls are doing on an oscilloscope to make you understand what we're doing. So with that analogy, I, I talked about the oscilloscope being a time machine in, the, in part one. And in essence, it is a time machine. And if you think, think of a, a device which acts as a time machine that you probably have in your pocket at the moment. And there's a very good chance you've probably got a cell phone in, or mobile phone near you. And on that phone, you will have both a video camera and it can take still, still pictures as well. And that's what the oscilloscope does. It's like a video camera capturing a picture over time because that's what it is. A stills camera where you're just taking a single photograph is to try and capture a single moment in time. And again, we use the oscilloscope to do that if we're trying to capture a signal to try and diagnose something. Now, believe it or not, that it may seem easy just using a camera and capturing a single shot but to do that properly and any photographer will know it takes time and skill to capture something with a single shot correctly it's actually far easier to use a video camera to try and capture something but there's certainly still some skill involved now there's some important components of a video camera and a camera that you use to capture a video for one, what you need to do ultimately is you need to frame whatever you're trying to capture. You need to be able to zoom and focus your camera and then set the, the frame rate correct so that you can capture things at a nice rate. With that framing, you have the option on, on a video camera. If you picture yourself that you're at a racetrack and you're trying to catch cars speeding down the track. For one, you need to be able to pan your camera around to be able to see what's happening, to put things in frame. And that panning is just like adjusting the time base on an oscilloscope. You also need to tilt. You need to move your camera up and down to capture things in frame and to make sure you get them in frame. And both, and that, that tilt process and adjusting, adjusting the time all relates to either adjusting your volts per division to capture your signal correctly or even moving it about with your vertical and your horizontal adjustment. Then the focus. So believe it or not there is a focus facility on an oscilloscope and that's associated with noise. Now if you think if you're trying to take a photograph of let's say an animal that's behind a tree or there's some grass that's going to be in your way and taking away from the picture so that is noise you also obviously want to get the, the lens focused so you can see what's going on properly and potentially you have the same issue with an oscilloscope you want to eliminate noise because potentially in your environment in your lab there may be noise that detracts from the actual signal you're trying to view 
And there, there's a few techniques. For one, when you're actually taking the measurement of your device under test, you want to be taking it in the best way you can to eliminate noise at the actual uh, device itself. So you want a short uh, lead in some cases. And then also, your oscilloscope has some features and functions on it to help you eliminate unnecessary noise. You can have bandwidth limiting and all kinds of features which help clear the picture for you so that you can see your signal. Then, in for instance, if you, let's say, you need to capture a single frame. Let's say you're out in the wilderness and you want to capture a picture of lightning, a lightning strike. Now that lightning strike, as you can imagine, is very difficult to catch. You're gonna have to click your camera, your shutter, just at the right time. And likewise on an oscilloscope, if you want to capture a fast signal in an instant, you need to trigger your oscilloscope at the right time. And it's all those bits and pieces which relate to cameras and video cameras which correlate very nicely to how an oscilloscope works. In today's exercise, when we get down to the bench, I'm going to just show, go through some basics of acquiring a signal. So in previous one we had some slow signals, but in this video today, just some basics on how to capture a signal, let's say a sinusoidal wave for instance, and often if you, if you are in a classroom or a lab, you may find um, that on your oscilloscope, because there's one easy way to catch it of course, there's an auto button. There's an automatic button which can go and size everything up correctly and then frame your signal that you want to see. Now, often your teachers and your lecturers will disable that and there's a good reason for that. It's just like having a camera on the automatic setting. On the automatic setting, you can get a reasonable picture, but if you want to get a really good picture and, and understand your picture and frame it properly and capture it properly, you need to go down to the manual settings. And that's where understanding how to acquire a signal and using those manual settings will really help you to, for one, frame your signal correctly, acquire your signal, and then allow you to move around and analyze that signal. So we'll start looking at the basics of that today. Right, now before we get down to the bench, one warning. You do need to be careful about the kind of signals that you put into your oscilloscope. Uh, in this example, we're going to start off by using a sine wave. Don't think you can go and get your probes and connect them to the mains outlet to go and measure the sine wave. There's a high risk of shock and damaging your equipment. So in this example, I'm going to use a signal generator. But if you don't have a signal generator to start experimenting, most oscilloscopes do have a test on them where they will produce a square wave to actually calibrate the probes. So use that as your test signal uh, rather than doing a, a signal you're not sure about. Perhaps even probing a power supply or anything like that could be dangerous to yourself and your equipment. Right, so let's start off by just introducing the oscilloscope that I'm going to be using for today's exercise. It is an Ag Agilent oscilloscope. It's the DSO-X2002A. It's a 70 MHz scope. It's got two channels. It really is a nice oscilloscope. I kind of class it as a mid-range oscilloscope. Um, you get top, top-end uh, oscilloscopes which cost many times more than this. But this is a big step up from the normal entry-level scopes. Doesn't mean you should have this oscilloscope to do this kind of work. No. I'm fortunate. I find it does make uh, life a little easier. It certainly does make capturing certain types of singles, signals a lot easier. But that doesn't mean you can't do this with a basic oscilloscope. In future videos, I will put the more basic oscilloscopes side by side so that we can see the pros and cons and how, they, how the various scopes work. But ultimately, you need to spend your money wisely in deciding what kind of scope you, you want. But I'll do a, a guide on that in later videos. But that's the oscilloscope, and then what I'm going to be using to actually generate the signal for the scope is a signal generator over here. And the signal we're going to be starting off with is a sinusoidal wave. As you can see, I've got specified over here. It's going to be going at 10, 10 kilohertz. So it's 10,000 hertz, or 10,000 times per second. And it's going to have an amplitude of 5 volt peak to peak. So something like a typical logic signal, 5 volt peak to peak. And there's going to be no offset. 
So the offset means whether it's it's going to be on the baseline, on the zero line, it's not sitting positive or below it. So let's see if we can acquire that signal. Right, so there's a few things that you do want to have done prior to kind of getting to this point, which again I'll cover off in another video, and that's obviously you'll no doubt have a set of test probes on a device under test, and I'll do a video where I explain setting those up so that they set up correctly so that your signal is uh, at the right calibration and what have you. And But certainly what we want to do when starting off is to make sure that if, for instance, if you've got two channels that you disable the one channel or switch off the one channel so you've got no other confusing signals if we're trying to obviously see what's coming in on your channel one. You're going to have your channel one switched on. You also want for your run control we want the, on here I've got the green light which actually tells me that the oscilloscope is continuously reading and looking for a signal. It's running. If I push it again you can see it goes red. It's in a stop mode so it's frozen the signal. That's not going to help us too much if we're trying to acquire a signal which is changing. So we're going to at the moment have it in the run mode and then play around with the controls to see if we can find that signal. Right, so let's just understand where the controls are for me on this oscilloscope so you understand what I'm doing when we're trying to get the signal in view. On the top here, I've got my horizontal adjustment, which changes the time base on the x-axis. I then also have this knob over here, which allows me to position or, or change the uh, relative position on the x-axis as well. I then obviously for the channel 1 I've got the setting here where I can change the volts per division on the Y axis. I then also have a knob which allows me to position or change the signal on that Y axis. Now what you probably want to do when you start off on my scope if I push these knobs it will automatically center them. So that means at least you've got no offset you've got everything centered correctly. And then like with a camera what you want to do is you need to kind of initially zoom out and then come zoom back in to try and find the picture that you're trying to frame or acquire the signal. Also what you want to go and check starting off is the mode we've got the set to DC coupling and that's probably for the start the most common mode you're going to be using on your oscilloscope. We'll talk about AC coupling in a further video but you want it on DC coupling to to start with. So I'm going to take certainly the time division and zoom that right out. As you saw initially, we couldn't see any signal. So I'm going to take my time division and I've turned it right to the point where I've got it at the maximum, 50 seconds per division. My volts per division, so that's my y-axis scale, I'm going to zoom that right out and I've taken that now to the maximum of 5 volts per division. On your scope, these settings may be different. It also depends on the uh, type of probe that you've got attached to your oscilloscope. But now that I've got it zoomed out, I'm going to see because at, at this rate, at 50 seconds per division, it's going to take a long time for me to see a signal. But now, so what we're going to do, we're going to reduce that time until we start to acquire the signal. And as you can see, slowly but surely, I've got a signal there and there we go we now have something in view so I can take it in further still we can see it looks a little bit messy but now in terms of the size at least I can see I can go in and increase the um, zoom in and see the signal by reducing the volts per division so in effect I'm zooming in to get a better full screen of the, the signal that we're trying to acquire so now that we've got that in scale, the problem is obviously that the signal is a bit mixed up. It's moving around. What we want to do is trigger the scope so that we can clearly see that. So remember, again, from the first video, we also have a trigger. You have some options where you can push it on mine. It's got a, you can push it in to set it at 50%, so it'll try and acquire it 50% uh, of the signal. But you can just manually, you can see the trigger line over here moving down as I make the adjustment and as I get to the signal you can see it seems to be more stable now. Now I'll take it up just to give you a more dramatic effect. Now we're going to change the time base again to get in a little bit closer and see if we can see more of that signal. Let's bring the trigger down now and there we go. 
we can actually see a nice sinusoidal wave. So it's literally that straightforward. It's a case of gently playing with these controls so that you can acquire the signal. And it's important that you know how to do that manually as opposed to merely going and pushing an automatic but button because when you need to study a certain part of a signal you need to be able to manually move around and get to certain parts. So by making these simple adjustments as you can see I may want to have a nice close-up view of the signal of the sinusoidal wave at the peak there so now what am I going to do I'm going to adjust the vertical adjustment so that I can pull that down into view and then if I wanted to I can then again go and change the volts per division and but now I'm out of scale I can't see that I'm going to adjust it again so that I pull it back into view and this is just practice is basically having a, a clean straightforward signal so I certainly suggest if you can get something to set up either a nice square wave and your oscilloscopes will have a test point on them mine's literally just down here where you can actually set up your probes you can use that and have a square wave and use that as a test signal to actually go practice acquiring changing the time base and seeing how things work and don't get scared if things suddenly go out of view again and aren't right take everything back out start again so that you've zoomed out and then slowly go back in and as you can see now I've got because I haven't centered if I go and push to zero you can see how it goes and centers thing so always remember go and center zero things zoom out slowly zoom back in and that's where you can start acquiring a signal and making adjustments to see how things work. Right, so let's just have a quick practical example of that. I've got the oscilloscope there and what I've done, I've gone and connected up a variable power supply to the oscilloscope and what I want to do here with the oscilloscope is understand the what kind of noise or ripple is perhaps coming out of this uh, power supply. There are a few interesting points to note which you are going to start picking up as I said in subsequent videos is that for one if you have a look at the cable that I'm using this isn't shielded and this in itself is going to be a challenge because this will be like an antenna for any noise in the lab. So this isn't the best thing to do I'm just using it as, as an example now but we'll pick up on these issues later on. So I've got the power supply, it's switched off. I'm going to switch it on. At the moment my signal is sitting zero because I've got nothing coming in at the moment. Um, you can already see, if we look very closely on that screen, you'll see there's already noise even on that straight line. And that's literally because of the cable that I'm using, or the connecting wires. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to switch on the power supply it's preset to 5 volts DC bang so as I switch it on you just see the signal disappear it goes up so let's see how we can acquire that signal and look at the noise output of the power supply right so that signals disappeared we want to have a look at the noise now I'm going to point out something straight off you'll remember that I said obviously the one thing you do want to check is the coupling mode and that you should be in DC coupling now in this example going to AC coupling is a very useful tool for looking at noise let's say on a DC signal that we will cover off in a separate video but now let's see if we can acquire that the actual signal that we're trying to look at so again what I've done I've you're going to push your um, positioning your horizontal and your vertical positioning to make sure they're zeroed we're then going to zoom out so that we get uh, a signal and as you can see I've already got something it's a bit slow so I'm going to I'm zooming in it's a bit slow so what I'm doing is obviously I'm changing the time base just to speed things up to kind of narrow our view our window I'm going to change the volts per division now as you can see what's happening here we've managed to get the signal back in view but if I try and step in too close because we're sitting at 5 volts we can see we've got 2 volts per division so that's 4 and looks almost halfway through so that's our 5 volts if I take another step I lose the signal so I come back out I can see the signal um, if I want to now get in closer to that 
I have a couple of challenges. If I start zooming in, what I have to do then is use the vertical position to bring it back down so that I can see it. So just make a note of this. So if you do have to work in a DC coupled mode, that you can obviously make use of that horizontal position to go and bring it, bring it in, the signal in. But now we've hit a point where I can't bring it down any further and I want to have a look at that signal. So what are we going to do? We're going to employ a feature which we'll talk more about in a later video, as I said, of AC coupling. Now what that has the effect of doing, it centers the signal. And I said we'll go into more detail about that. So now I can center, go back to center because I've got my signal there. And now I can change, I can increase the volts per division so that I'm zooming in or getting closer to that signal to see what's going on. And I can obviously change my time base to speed things up. And by doing that, I can then get a better indication of analyzing the signal. Now, by the looks of it, it seems like there's a, a pulse, some kind of switching that's going on. And that can be as a result of many items that potentially are either artifacts from the power supply itself or in the lab. And the next step to be able to have a look at those correctly is to employ some kind of triggering. Because if we have a look at our triggering, I've got the trigger there, but that's not really helping. What I can do is I can push the run stop button, and I'm going to do that now, and then that freezes the signal for us. So at this point, we can obviously then go and zoom in and out with our oscilloscope and go and look at different parts of that signal. And this is where practice capturing a signal like that and using all the knobs to kind of move around, zoom in, can then give you a greater understanding of what, what's going on. So this is obviously a useful tool for that when you've got a kind of consistent signal which you can stop and analyze. However, that's not always the case. You may have something where you get a signal which is either intermittent and just coming in or something you want to capture briefly over a period of time. And that's where using the single shot and your triggering becomes really, really handy. And we'll pick up on that in the next video. Right, so I hope you gained some value from that exercise. As I say, going forwards, um, we'll start to see more of the acquisition modes, how you can actually capture a single shot. We'll look at the performance of different oscilloscopes. And through this exercise, I also hope to employ some practical applications, whether it's looking at filters and how you can uh, measure the input, look at the input of a filter and then look at the output of a filter. Uh, the considerations in terms of having isolated probes or isolated inputs on your oscilloscope. But that we'll get to in future videos. But anyway, if you gain any value, please give us a thumbs up and share it, and I'll catch you soon for the next one. Cheers.